Welcome to Rock Center Shorts. I'm Kristen Savell, Executive Director at the Rock Center for Corporate Governance at Stanford. Today, we're going to talk about the role of the board in overseeing corporate DEI initiatives in the wake of the Supreme Court's decision striking down affirmative action programs in college admissions. My guest today is Francesca O'Dell, a partner at Cleary Gottlieb. Francesca leads the firm's corporate advisory practice and regularly advises boards and management on a variety of topics, including ESG issues and disclosure and compliance matters. Welcome, Francesca. Thanks, Kristen, and thanks for having me. Wonderful to have you here. Great. At this point, most people are undoubtedly familiar with the recent Supreme Court ruling in Students for Fair Admissions v. Harvard. But just to level set, can you give us a quick overview of the decision and the facts leading up to it? Sure. Um, and the Supreme Court has been pretty busy, so, <laughs> so it's always good to uh, go back and take a, a quick look. So um, the decision came down in June of uh, 2023, so about six months ago. Um, and uh, the, the case at hand was regarding the admission policies, as you mentioned, at Harvard and UNC. And the claim was um, that they permitted uh, an applicant's race to be considered as one part um, of an overall holistic assessment of that um, applicant. And the Supreme Court decision basically held that those admission programs, as they were formed, um, violated both the Equal Protection Clause um, and Title VI of the Civil Rights Act. Um, so what does that mean, right? Because when that decision came down, I think a lot of folks were, were expecting the decision um, to come down that way. Um, but also there was a lot of kind of confusion around what it actually meant. Um, and under those two, um, under the Equal Protection Clause and Title VI, race-based classifications need to be justified by a compelling interest um, and they have to be pursued through means narrowly tailored to achieve that interest. And so the decision basically held that those colleges and, and the admissions programs probably of a number of similar colleges, um, that the proposed interest that they had achieving um, all of the educational benefits of diversity, just said in a general manner, was not sufficiently measurable to determine that it was um, compelling. And so under that analysis and under um, strict scrutiny, then they wouldn't survive. So um, the the decision in that case, in those cases, um, was limited, you know, to Title VI, um, which has limited application. But um, there were, a, you know, that decision I think had a lot of ripple effects. First of all, I mean, clearly through universities and other schools and educational systems that had any type of admissions policy um, that discussed race. But also, I think you know, we saw ripple effects through a lot of. Um, other uh, areas, including in particular the private sector. Well, that brings me nicely to my next question. Because <laughs> there still seems to be a lot of confusion around whether the Harvard decision applies to private employers, and if so, what types of changes employers need to make uh, to their DEI initiatives to remain compliant. What I often hear is that companies shouldn't worry too much because workplace policies that were legal before the ruling remain legal now, but that employers should reevaluate those policies in light of the ruling, which seems a little contradictory and a little vague. Uh, so I'm hoping you can shed some light on what the Harvard decision actually means for private employers and for their corporate DEI programs. Sure, and and this is kind of from an employment aspect, right? Um, but um, I think I think what you just described, although somewhat inconsistent, is actually, they're both correct, right? Um, explicitly, that ruling does not um, give new legal obligations to employers because it was decided under Title VI and it wasn't decided under Title VII. And Title VII um, is what um, would apply to private employers. So the exact letter of that decision does not impact private employers. However, you know, those Title VI and Title VII sit side by side and um, have very similar language um, and also kind of have similar purposes. And so because the statutes are so similar, um, there are two types of concerns. One, that another case will come up and will be explicitly decided in a similar manner. Um, and two, that, you know, because employment decisions are determined under Title VII and that language is so similar that courts could start 
using that lens um, for interpreting that language. And in the not in the in the concurrent opinion, not the majority opinion, but the concurrence, um, there was a lot of language in there about the fact that the Title VII language uh, tracks the Title VI language, and even some claims. Um, that, you know, do the dissenters really read the same words in, you know, neighboring provisions of a very similar statute to mean totally different things. So I think there was just a lot of language in there that makes um, private employers a little bit worried that this could be expanded. So um, when you think about it through that lens, I think you land um, in the second part of your question, right? Mm -hmm. um, what should employers be doing to kind of think through what um, impacts this decision can has on their policies, could have on their policies, and what types of actions they can kind of start taking um, to, you know, to to be conscious of the possibility that a decision like that could get extended. Um, and I think that in that vein, um, employers are, and and sorry, I should back up as well. You know, the whole um, environment around. Um, this issue was pretty heated even before the Supreme Court made that decision. You saw a lot of um, uh, claims like what we sometimes call anti-discrimination claims, right? Um, legal or other types of claims um, against private employers that um, individuals who were not in any protected class or who were not um, targeted in diversity programs were being disadvantaged by those programs. Um, so I, I think that the combination of that general environment and the potential risks there and the fact that uh, the decision could be extended is what's really leading employers to look at their programs. And since, of course, <laughs> since the Supreme Court decision um, came across, there has been, you know, an uptick in all sorts of litigation um, mm -hmm. around those types of issues. So it definitely is um, an area that is receiving a lot of attention and that employers are starting to focus even more on. All right. So clearly the Harvard decision has injected some uncertainty around how employers can best achieve workplace DEI goals. What do you see as the role of the board in navigating the shifting DEI landscape? Yeah, so I mean, the role of the board, so under, you know, under corporate law in the US, the duties of the board are determined um, by state law, right? Um, and so we oftentimes look to Delaware to, to see what the gold standard is <laughs> um, in terms of kind of corporate governance and, and board oversight. So the board duties in particular in a public company, but in any company are uh, focused on um, uh, carrying out their fiduciary duties, right? Thinking about the best interests of uh, the shareholders in a company and then uh, an oversight duty. So while we typically think of management as running the day-to-day -day aspects of the business, the board is supposed to be overseeing management. So not necessarily making policy, but uh, overseeing management's making of policy and making sure that, that those policies um, and the way that they're applied are done in a way that doesn't cause uh, risk for the company, that um, benefits the shareholders. So, so those fiduciary duties kind of govern how the board should be overseeing um, operations or business at the company. You know, directors get to rely on um, on certain protections under state law too, and so they can rely on the business judgment rule and other types of protections that I won't go into detail with now. Um, but it just sort of frames uh, their overall duty in terms of making sure that they are asking management the right questions um, and making sure that management is has the best interest of the company and its stakeholders in mind. So when you when you look at that um, in an issue like this the board will wanna make sure that management has sat down and understood the potential impacts of a decision like this, that they are thinking about how that could impact um, their business and their policies and the different risks um, that the, the company may be presented with, and then thinks about how to mitigate um, those risks. So, uh, you know, that those are, those are heavy duties <laughs> um, for directors, right? And it, it requires having some understanding of those issues and, and being educated around those issues, but also really asking the right questions and making sure that they're getting the right information flow um, from the company.
So to that last point, how should a board keep apprised of the company's DEI activities and risks? And as part of your response, it'd be great to know who should be reporting to the board, how often, and if there are specific questions that boards should be asking their management teams. Yeah, it's a it's a great point, and it's one that um, arises around a number of ESG, right, environmental, um, social, and governance issues. Because the board uh, the board's role is very important, but you also have to set up a structure that supports that role. So, um, most, for taking public company boards as an example, they usually have a few committees. Um, you know, a, a governance and nominating committee, um, an audit committee, and a compensation committee at a minimum, and then sometimes, um, you know, some other committees that support the board. So um, these duties can be fulfilled through a committee of the board or the board itself, right? Um, and in either case, it's important to have um, the primary risks uh, that the company faces on the agenda. Um, for board meetings so that those risks are discussed on a regular basis. In this context, I think um, boards oftentimes have ESG risk um, at a you know at a minimum one supporter on their agenda so that they can have a full briefing on um, on issues that have arisen with respect to DEI in particular, since it's been kind of a hot button area over the last couple of years. I think boards have either got committees or boards have gotten briefed on that fairly regularly. Um, in terms of who speaks to the board, it really depends on the structure of the company, but um, someone from management and someone with specific knowledge about the company's policies and how they're being implemented and how potential risks could impact the company should be um, speaking to the board or the board should have access to that individual and have the ability to ask questions. Sometimes around DEI issues that can live in a, in a people function, like a human resources function. Other times that can um, live in a particular operating or, or governance area. It doesn't so much matter where it's handled at the company level, but that the board has access to those individuals and has an understanding of the policies and what the company is doing really um, to face those types of risks. I footnote that if there is um, DEI related litigation at the company, that too should be reported on regularly. Sometimes that'll flow up through an audit committee that is looking at specific litigation risk, sometimes to the full board. Um, in this, in this ever evolving um, world, I think you have two types of litigation that you now have to be concerned about, right? You have the traditional, like the, the discrimination claims that we all used to see, um, which is discrimination against someone from a historically underrepresented group. Um, and that type of litigation risk still exists, right? And, and, and one could argue that that is um, the largest type of litigation risk around DEI issues. But we now have the flip side of that, which is litigation risk around um, issues that are raised, right, by the, the SFFA case and, and related concerns about um, groups being negatively affected by DEI policies. Mm -hmm. And since we are talking about litigation risk, uh, Francesca, do you think directors could be held personally liable for things like misstating DEI information or overstating DEI commitment goals? Is that a real risk that directors should be thinking about? You know, I think that directors can always, well, there are two types of claims, I guess. There are kind of, um, claims against directors for breaches of their duties, the types of duties that we talked about before, fiduciary duties, duties of care and loyalty. Um, the, there are ways to protect against those types of claims, right, by um, doing what I just described, by, by basically fulfilling your fiduciary duties, making sure that the board is being well-informed, asking questions, um, keeping a record of all of that. Um, under the securities laws, which is most relevant for public companies, right, there are additional types of potential liability for directors. Um, there's general anti-fraud um, liability for um, when a company makes false or misleading statements or omits a material fact. So, you know, taken to its extreme, um, you could you could potentially have an argument that um, there was a material misstatement or omission based on diversity in a in a public filing. Um, when a company is offering securities, that standard of liability gets heightened. Um, and um, and then you're looking at an actual offering document and what the company has said in that offering document. Now, 
you know, the, the, the primary stop for those claims is usually at the company. Um, but a lot of times when those types of claims, especially securities claims are made, directors and officers will get named. Um, for those folks who are listening or directors and officers, they'll know, but obviously there's directors and officers, um, insurance, liability insurance and the like to, to assist with that. Otherwise no one would ever wanna be um, a director <laughs> of a public company. But, uh, but there are also things that companies can do in their disclosures and do do, and it's very um, common and accepted practice, which is to highlight potential risks of the company, right? So potential risks that the company may not meet particular targets or that they can't control. Um, particular, uh, the whether um, information that is disclosed comes to fruition. Um, and there are also disclaimers about forward-looking statements that make clear that um, aspirational goals, as long as they are clearly stated as aspirational and not fact, um, you know, arguing that those should not be actionable because it's a goal, not a promise um, to investors. And that, of course, just like financial results can't be um, guaranteed, nor can um, other diversity related targets or goals. So you can't insulate completely against that. Um, but I think there is a lot that companies can do to protect directors and officers, as long as those statements are made in you know, good faith. And I think that that process of, of thinking about what should be disclosed and verifying that information is an important one because because that process too will will protect um, all the players involved in in any kind of disclosure like that. Okay, well, let's talk for a minute about disclosures. Yeah, companies got pretty zealous with their Z DEI disclosures in the wake of George Floyd's murder. Uh, many made pledges and promises and commitments to diversity goals. Now we're seeing some backlash against DEI initiatives and companies have to decide whether to stick by their earlier disclosures or change them. And it seems like both options may carry some risk. So how should companies be thinking about DEI disclosures in today's more complicated environment? Yeah, it, you know, it is not an easy <laughs> um, thing to navigate, right? On the one hand, um, everyone from, um, stock exchanges, right? NASDAQ has certain diversity disclosure requirements to institutional investors, um, BlackRock, State Street, all of those large investors um, have uh, stewardship guidelines of what they'd like to see when it comes to diversity policies and disclosure and actions. Um, so you have a lot of players on the investment or investor side that are looking um, to see uh, how the company is progressing on diversity related issues. There are also all of the studies out there that demonstrate the benefits of a diverse uh, culture, a diverse decision-making environment and all that. So that's on one side, right? That companies are grappling with. On the other side, there are a number of um, politicians and other organizations that are um, that are, are coming at the issue from from a different direction, quite frankly, right? And putting quite a bit of pressure on companies with respect to diversity and ESG related um, disclosure and policies. So it is a very fine line <laughs> um, that companies have to have to tread. I think that there's two types of of um, disclosures, I guess. There are the types of public statements that companies make about whether they support something or whether they stand behind something. And then there are actual disclosures about the goals and policies of the company. I think one thing that's important in every environment, no matter what um, uh, the political waters uh, feel like, is to always be reanalyzing those disclosures and making sure that the company is speaking consistently across um, different media and across different um, reporting uh, means. And so that I think, I mean, we, we tell companies and boards that you should be making sure that management is doing that all the time. Right, regardless of the issue and, and regardless of how um, politically charged it may be at the moment. I do think that there is in this investing population and in this environment, there is a, a big pressure um, to include that type of information in disclosures. And so, you know, I think important for companies to look at that disclosure today in light of the current environment, make sure that it is linked to actual strategies and goals of the company. That's always the best um, protection when it comes to disclosure if, or 
when it comes to an initiative, if it is, if the company believes that there is a business um, imperative behind that, then it, that that it that supports that statement and the reason why it should be important to investors. Um, and then look across all the different, you know, companies have websites, sustainability reports, diversity statements, reporting of EEO1 data and other employment information. So making sure that, that there's a process for verifying all of that information, that it's consistent and that the company kind of understands its guiding principles when it comes to those types of issues. I think that that is important to be doing now more than ever, just given the political and potential legal attention around those kinds of issues. If a company does have an aspirational diversity goal out there that they don't feel that they're going to be able to meet, perhaps in light of the Harvard decision or otherwise, do you advise them to make alterations to that disclosure or how should they be handling that? Yeah, it, I mean, that depends a lot on timing and other aspects, right? Um, I think it's important for companies to think about when they should be speaking and when they have the right amount of information to speak. Um, you know, not that many companies put specific number targets on employees, but they will have broader goals, right? Like our goal is to have um, more women and diverse representation at the management level. Some some put some, you know, kind of um, uh, guardrails or or guidelines around that, but but rarely is that numerical. I, I think if 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 companies believe that those are that they won't be able to meet those, I think in light of the need to make sure that that disclosure is accurate, they can't be out there repeating that disclosure, right? And when companies have a duty to update, depends a lot on the circumstances. If you are out there saying things, um, then you need to make sure those things are accurate and that you're updating. If you're in a quiet period and not speaking on a matter, I think then you, the company has a flexibility to update that the, the next time they speak. But as a general matter, um, at some point in time, you have to refine those goals, right? If they're no longer goals that are attainable. And oftentimes, you know, kind of think about how those goals impact the company's other operational and financial targets. Um, and then think through holistically how they want to rearticulate um, how they're thinking about that particular metric or goal. All right, last question for you, Francesca. Yeah. <laughs> Do you think the Harvard decision and the backlash we're seeing against DEI and ESG more broadly have changed how companies are thinking about when to speak on social or political issues? Obviously, we have an election coming up this year. It's likely to be contentious. Uh, yeah. So this issue will be top of mind for many companies. Yeah. Given the, you know, the, the investing climate right now is one where you have a lot of populations with a lot of expectations that companies will speak out, right? So it depends to some extent what industry um, a company is in and who their investors and, and, and customers are, right? There are some companies that are very vocal and very um, uh, ESG forward in their speech. And that's largely because their consumer populations demand it. Right? They want their brand to be um, expressing the principles that they themselves um, agree with. And I think that, and then there are some companies that aren't that consumer facing um, and have a different kind of profile and investor base. Um, and we've seen play out in the news, right? Um, how speaking out publicly on political issues can impact a company. Um, I think it's a very important topic for management to think through and to have a, a policy towards and then for boards to understand. So, um, for example, a company needs to decide whether they are going to speak out on political conflicts, let's say, or, or let's say it's a, a military conflict, right, or geopolitical issues. And, and then make sure that when they're speaking out on that, they're doing so consistently, right? Not just issue selecting and, and only speaking out sometimes. And then also to think it in that vein, to think about all of the different stakeholders of the company, right? And to make that doesn't mean that companies can't have principles and stand behind them. I think that's 
it's very important and both for business strategy and for stakeholder interests. But it does mean that companies have to be very thoughtful about it and analyze all the potential impacts and risks, right? So if your customer base is extremely broad um, and there could be customer backlash for political positions or statements that the company may make, then it doesn't mean they can't make them, but it does mean that management needs to think through what the potential implications of those statements may be on the business, on its financial stability, and then ultimately on kind of um, the interests of various stakeholders in the business. So it, it's a complex um, decision, you know, the, and there's even more, you know, if you look back 10 years ago, there was not so much pressure on uh, companies to speak out and take positions on issues. And that's in part because our population, especially our younger population expects a lot um, from companies and from brands they use and like. And it's also a fact of the digital age and how quickly information moves and how frequently companies need to be on social media. So um, definitely uh, not an easy issue to manage um, as a management team or a board, but an important one, right, to, to have policies around and to make sure that decisions related to, to those types of issues are thoughtful ones. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much, Francesca. It was great speaking with you today. Thank you. I really appreciate it. And thanks to everyone in the audience for joining us. See you next time. Thanks.